Hello and welcome to the Semiconductor Industry Association's public webinar series where we talk about the issues that are most important to the chip industry. My name is Robert Casanova. I'm Director of Industry Statistics and Economic Policy here at SIA and I'll be your host and, and moderator for today's uh, webinar titled A Review of, of the Market of 2023 and a Look to 2024. Um, before I introduce the panel, I just want to give it a quick housekeeping uh, tip. Uh, for the Q&A section, please make sure you uh, provide your questions through the Q&A function and not through the chat function. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce our panel. Um, first, starting with Dan Hutchinson, uh, Vice Chair at Tech Insights. We also have Dale Ford, Chief Analyst at the Electronics Components Industry Association. We also have Lita Sean Roy, President, CEO, and Founder of TechSet. And finally, Christopher Danley, who is a Managing Director at Citi, focusing on the semiconductor industry. Now, before I, I pass it along to our first panelist, I just wanted to give a, cu a few quick uh, statistics for the, the industry in 2023. Um, to no one's surprise, we did see a decline in, in sales from 2022 to 2023 of 8.2%. Um, and this was uh, expected by the industry and, and most analysts. Um, fortunately, the, the decline in sales weren't as, as large as we had uh, initially anticipated. Um, I, I do wanna also note that on a moving average basis, the latter half of last year, the, the, indus the industry did see month to month growth, um, which was also expected um, and really uh, those industries that we are expecting to be major demand drivers for semiconductors out to, to the end of this decade really uh, put, propelled the industry in the second half of last year. With that, I want to turn it over to Dan Hutchinson uh, to begin his uh, presentation. To you, Dan. Thank you, Robert, for having me here today. I'm really honored to be part of this. So um, anyway, to kind of get into my what we see happening, um, you know, we actually see a pretty good year for 2024. Uh, we're seeing the uh, uh, semiconductor equipment still growing, even though it grew last year in a downturn for ICs. It's going to grow about 3% this year. We see ICs growing about 16% and uh, um, the electronics market growing around 7%. And inside of that, the uh, uh, DRAM market is, uh, is going to be the hottest growth. It's being driven really heavily by AI. We've got it up 39% this year, uh, with NAND growing uh, 35%. In part, it's just simply reversing the decline that it had last year, uh, a decline that was really determined by just this huge glut. You probably recall from, I think it was June of 2022, in which we uh, said there was a massive glut in memory and, and semiconductors. So, um, that's there. We see logic coming back with healthy 14% growth. Um, but, you know, the auto uh, analog and power side is going to be weaker this year because high interest rates are really putting a clamp on industrial investment as well as is the automotive market. People are having a hard time getting into those cars. But in, in terms of, of you know, we still have these problems like, the you know, the glut's over, but, you know, inventory is back in control, but it's still running high. And uh, so we're seeing uh, uh, some of those those issues still plague us. And uh, and then the one thing I, I need to kind of, uh, you, you know, who was it? Uh, Yogi Berra said forecasting is difficult, especially when it's about the future. And, you know, I think one of the things that's really made it difficult, like last year, in the early part of last year, everybody said there was going to be a big downturn. It was going to be very deep. Some had it down. Semiconductors down more than twenty percent. Uh, the uh, uh, the macro economists were all predicting a big downturn, um, which didn't happen. And uh, and I think the the big issues you there is you still have this this hangover from COVID that's going on, where all this money was pumped into the economy, and then you have this huge shift to buying devices, which reset the replacement cycle for those, and then you have. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, this shortage in autos that caused, you know, you go through shortage and then you go through glut. And and so 
especially in electric cars, there's a real problem there. So it's having these reverberations. You've also got this, this you know, the, the the great power conflict between the United States and and China has intensified and, you know, throw Russia in there with the war in the Ukraine. So you, you've got a lot of global, global conflict going on. You've got political polarization in the United States where you can't get stuff through uh, Congress. Um and then, it, you know, in the, in the big picture, there's also this transition to green energy. There's restructuring of the supply chain globally uh, to kind of re-globalize technology and where it's manufactured. So there's a lot going on there that, you know, historically we haven't had. And you could see that in a way last year, because I remember cautioning people that if you looked at the diversity, the range of the forecast of the different forecasters, they were really wide. And whenever the, the range of the forecast are really wide, it means that uh, there's a lot more chance for variability. There's a lot more unknowns out there. And so everyone is, you know, when you get into the, you know, beyond the just the statistical weighting to the analyst weighting, you wind up with uh, different results and, and different opinions about where the market's going to go. So, uh, uh, and I'm sure because the biggest thing I get back from customers is, is what did we do wrong last year? You know, how, how do we miss the forecast so badly? And um, uh, and and it's not just and when I say we, I mean they're saying that about them as well. I mean everybody missed it last year, and I think it's just the times that we're in, and and that's not over yet. It's going to be you know a tough couple of years, and so you need a lot more bandwidth in your in your uh, management style. Um, the fun thing about last year too, in terms of at the beginning of the year, everybody said Moore's law was dead. And at the end of the year, all of a sudden it's alive again. And in fact, there was this great article in the economist about Schrodinger's cat, that it was both dead and alive. And, uh, um, so that was kind of there. And then, you know, the thing that was last year, I predicted that the, the chips act wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't get money last year. And we certainly didn't. We're finally starting to at least get it released. So that's sort of the, the cool thing. And then when we look into 2024, I think another thing that's going to make it very difficult, it's the biggest election year in history going forward. So those are really, uh, uh huge issues to, uh, to worry about. And so, uh, um, and then you get into this, are, is there going to be a downturn in the United States? There are some people now uh, predicting that it'll come at the second half of the year. And you, you have, at the economist level, you have these two groups. One's saying, oh, it's there's the soft landing, never landing group. And then there's the other group that is simply pushing out their 2023 downturn forecast out into the future. And uh, so that's really happening. Personally, I am in the uh, uh, soft landing campaign camp. For 2024, I think we might have a hard landing in 2025. One of the big issues is because it's election year. I think the, you know, the Fed hasn't been lowering rates as as the market has expected, and that's you, you know my personal belief is they're looking at it, saying, well, if we get a Republican, we're going to be back in the mode where all of a sudden they want to get rid of the Fed and then put control of the money supply inside Congress and in the administration. Uh, so they're going to be cautious about lowering interest rates because if they do, the first thing they're going to get hit with is they're trying to bias the election and in favor of Biden by uh, lowering interest rates and freeing up the money supply. So um, uh, you're not going to see this until the second half uh, of what's going on. And, um, and then the other big thing that's happened in the last week or two was everyone I'm sure read about Sam Altman saying that he wanted to put together five to seven trillion dollars to to restructure the semiconductor industry. Um, yesterday, I saw him at the Intel uh, uh, Foundry seminar that was being held and uh, where they changed their name from IFS to Intel Foundry. Um, and um, he kind of walked back uh, his five to seven trillion dollar number. You know, if you really wanted to do it, that's the kind of number you need to completely replace the existing semiconductor industry. But it's like, you know, the capacity that you would build and stuff like that would just be insane. And so uh, I think that's just not a possibility. So anyway, with that, I'll uh, let you move on, Robert, to the next speaker. Thanks, Dan. Um, a lot of a, a lot of great insight from the previous year and, and uh, uh, prospects for this year. Um, Dale, I'll pass it along to you. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very uh, insightful comments there from Dan. I appreciate that. And maybe what I share will uh, uh, reinforce some of the points that he was making there. So let me uh, pull up my slides here. I apologize. Oh, hang on. Nope, that's not what I wanted to share. I apologize. Let me move to a new mode. And come up here. All right, let's try this again. There we go. Okay. All right, we're ready to rock and roll here now. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, some of what I'll share will be uh, complementary to what Dan is just discussing. Uh, just a quick review of uh, what I'm going to cover. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any one slide today. I'm going to try and cover a, a, a lot of ground, just to cover a, what I think are a lot of important topics. So if we begin, first of all, by looking at the cycle of our, of our industry, at ECIA, we track all of the electronics components uh, uh, to support the authorized uh, channel. And so beyond semiconductors, we also track the passives categories, uh, capacitors, resistor, resistors, and inductors, as well as electromechanical, connector devices, batteries, et cetera. But just a, a quick summary here, we do detailed work with the World Passive Trade Statistics that we uh, uh, are a key member, and we roll up both the Americas and the worldwide view for capacitors, resistors, and inductors. And here we see this uh, uh, synchronization, I guess you could say, between the growth in the semiconductor industry and the growth in the passives industry. And interestingly, um, on a worldwide basis, we see pretty close alignment. We, all, we don't have data for Q4 yet on the passive side. We'll have that next month. But we see pretty close alignment in terms of these growth curves, particularly uh, this upturn uh, coming at the same time as we headed into the second quarter of 2023 in the quarter over quarter picture here. Uh, the Americas, interestingly enough, um, while the semiconductor industry uh, turned up in the quarter over quarter uh, through Q3, we were still kind of bouncing along the bottom there in the passive space. So a bit of a delay there uh, for the passives by comparison. But we do see that there is somewhat of an alignment between these cycles. Now, that was showing a revenue view. If we look at a picture where we see the unit shipments uh, on a worldwide basis, uh, again, it's quite interesting. We see that there's a much greater volatility in terms of unit shipments in the passives than we have on the semiconductor side. The other thing that's interesting to me, if we focus on the right side of this figure, is that in terms of unit shipments, we had a strong rebound in, in volumes on the passives. And uh, that's a key to, on a worldwide basis, the, the, the revenue growth. On the other hand, we saw that the revenue growth was, was similar for semiconductors, but the slope there for unit shipments is not as sharp. And so I'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, we'll point to the, the important role that the ASP trends play in shaping the cycle. Now, Going beyond, uh, the, here we track the orders that are taking place. So if we look at the data that we're very uh, oh, lucky to have from WSTS, uh, that data reflects some um, uh, revenue recognition, whereas uh, sometimes it's helpful to get a little bit of a view looking forward based on the orders. <laughs> and uh, this view looks at the, the passives, interconnect passives and electromechanical orders. And so maybe give a little bit of a glimpse of what we can expect in terms of recognized revenues in the future. And the good news is that as we've started into this new year of 2024, we had an, what I would say is quite an abrupt transition from uh, a more negative view from the, the prior year in terms of order growth to a, a very strong growth in terms of uh, orders coming into 2024. So hopefully we will be able to, to sustain this moving forward. So focused more on the semiconductor industry, just uh, to visualize what we're talking about here, we see that 
we uh, actually bottomed out in the, you know, as we started into 2023 in terms of the quarter over quarter growth uh, for semiconductors. And that led to uh, bottoming out in the annualized growth picture as we entered into the second half of 2023. So uh, we did outperform expectations, even expectations that were, you know, forecast in the fall wound up uh, uh, only 8.2% down. So only a, sing a single digit decline compared to, as Dan was mentioning, many people expecting double digit decline from the annualized rate. A Asia kicking in, starting to see a recovery there was critical to helping us turn this fall around. But coming back to the supply chain, you know, the question remains, how well is the supply chain balanced to sustain uh, future growth? Now here, you always have to pull out the memory to really get a more accurate picture of what's taking place. So if you pull out the DRAM and the data flash from the overall semiconductor picture, that, that volatile pattern really can, can uh, amplify the up and down cycles. And if you look at the non-memory semiconductors, you know, you'll see, yeah, we, we experienced a downturn, but it was really you know, modest uh, in, in relative terms. And, and the good news there is that it's, it's similar to what we've seen in prior cycles where the memory really will amplify the overall semiconductor view, but the rest of the market typically is more um, muted in terms of its cyclical behavior. Now here, I, this is a spaghetti chart and I recognize this. You, I just wanna glance at this for a second just to kind of see the, the overall trends and the, I guess you could say the bulk of how the herd is moving here in terms of the semiconductor industry, but you really can't distinguish individual segments. So just to take a moment and look at some of these individual segments, the, the solid line shows the growth in the Americas and it's quarter over quarter and the dashed line shows the worldwide view. And the interesting thing here is that discrete's actually um, kind of counter cyclical behavior uh, as we see weak to declining growth in terms of the discrete segment. And I think what we've seen here is this is one of the segments that's been much more vulnerable to excess inventory buildup and having to work off that excess inventory. Uh, in a similar picture, um, the analog IC market, same thing, a bit of a counter cyclical view with um, a downward trend, solid strong downward trend in the Americas, uh, still declining growth, but not, not, to, not headed down still in the worldwide view. But, I think that these types of components, particularly discretes and analog, were some of the most vulnerable to uh, the, the inventory challenges. On the other hand, if we look at the logic I see market, it's notable that in the Americas, we never went negative. We had a very strong year uh, in the Americas in terms of logic I see growth. And now we see this very strong uh, recovery on the worldwide basis. Um, come on. Similarly, uh, in micro components, uh, the America is only a slight downturn, but both of these with a strong upward trend. And I think uh, in both of these areas, you know, we see the benefits that we're driving in terms of demand for semiconductors from uh, all of the equipment uh, that's required to support the world of AI. And then here we see the overall picture and interestingly, you know, this recovery, both the Americas and worldwide have had a very similar profile. So looking at all of the cycles and starting at the same point in time and normalizing them to, to zero, uh, the last cycle uh, that we had ended just short of 48 months, which is the typical length of a semiconductor industry, kind of a four year length. And we ended up uh, the, the cycle that began in November, 2019, we ended that cycle and we started a new cycle. Uh, and that new cycle began uh, five months ago and we've already improved 6.1% above the bottom on an annualized growth basis. So very encouraging start to a new cycle in the industry. So looking forward, uh, we have the uh, WSTS semiconductor forecast that we look at and we see that um, more optimism for the Americas, but that's probably more due to the, uh, the memory mix there. Uh, but still, we're looking at double digit growth both in 2024 and in 2025. And so, so some real optimism with some, some uh, sustained growth through 2026. 
We would support that in terms of the start here that we do our annual, well, our monthly in this case view of how sales performance compares to the prior month. And if we look at uh, January, um, we had a strong upturn and the expectations looking out in our January survey into February were for uh, breaking above 100, which would indicate uh, growth in orders compared to the prior month. Similarly, if we look at the end markets, uh, the dash and the solid lines, the dash line shows the expectations for the next month. So in February, again, we are expecting this index to break positive in terms of growth. My friend Bill Jewell of Semiconductor Intelligence has put together some helpful charts. Dan talked about the variability in the different forecasts. I guess the, the best thing you can say here is that uh, all but one of the forecasts do, do sit in the uh, double digit range for expectations. But on the other hand, if you look on the left-hand side, he's shown kind of the guidance for uh, Q1 from the earnings calls. And uh, it's not exciting guidance for the first quarter. Now, that's okay in my view, because as we'll come back, we'll see that in some of these cycles, uh, there can be a bit of a pause. And so I think we might see a little bit of a pause in things in the first quarter, but that doesn't mean that we won't be able to sustain momentum through the rest of the year. And I can't forecast technically as, a, as an industry association, but if we stay on the curve we're on, we could hit a trillion dollars by 2033. So just quickly on the supply chain, uh, just in terms of uh, time, I'm just gonna note, we see that you know we've, We've come off the strong growth profile we saw in terms of uh, unit shipments in uh, all these major categories. So what is driving this growth? Well, here's the profile that we see if, if we look at the ASP growth in December of 2023 compared to January of uh, 2021, two and three. So if we look at that, we see that we had some really strong ASP growth in major categories. And that ASP growth is really responsible for getting us where we're at right now. Uh, similarly, we've come off this growth pattern in shipments for the Americas, but ASPs will play a key role. The good news from the supply chain is that we have stability is the dominant uh, response when people are asked about uh, whether they see increasing or decreasing lead times in the supply chain. Here, if we look at the uh, uh, supply chain risk index from Lehigh University, Interestingly, cybersecurity and customer risk have moved up strongly in terms of becoming the most significant issues people are looking at, but we see that there's a notable level of risk across the board. Now, economic impact, um, not time to go into this in detail. I haven't shared this in a while, but we do have alignment between economic forces and the electronics manufacturing and uh, semiconductor industries. And we, we see that continuing. They're fairly cautious when they forecast GDP looking out in time, but uh, we do see this. And so it's notable that we do, we do need to have kind of a, a, a necessary condition for us to, to sustain growth is the right conditions in the economy. And uh, NAM, uh, looking at their expectations, you know, their risks they point out are geopolitical turmoil, slow global economic growth, cost pressures, recession potential, and labor issues. So just to finish up on the last couple of points, you know, we look at this and we go, oh man, we dodged a bullet, the inflation's come back down. We're back down to 3.1%, yay. Well, you know, maybe a little too soon to say yay. Uh, if we look at the comparison between our current inflation uh, profile and the inflation that we had, it was so brutal back in the 70s, uh, here you see that they match pretty well on click kit. In fact, if you remove that DC offset, you know, it's maybe a little bit too soon to uh, um, start breathing. <laughs> we, we need to keep an eye on this inflation. And Dan talked about the issue with how the Fed will behave and what will play out there. And uh, we do need to continue to keep our eye on that inflationary picture. And then last point, there's so much to be excited about. Every week there's multiple major announcements. Uh, and beyond the components, you know, this need for speed, for power, you know, we see a, a lot of developments in the material space, um, whether it's uh, the, the lithium materials and gels for EVs, whether it's um, nuclear fusion, 
Uh, I remember back gosh, 35, 40 years ago, so much excitement when the University of Utah announced that they had uh, d developed fusion that delivered a net uh, positive output in terms of energy output compared to input. Unfortunately, a little while later, after those worldwide headlines, they found that the, the measurements weren't as precise as they needed to be, and they, you know, false signal. But uh, now we're back on the fusion path. We're looking at new materials for semiconductors, graphene-based chips combined with silicon carbide. Just a lot of exciting developments there to give a lot of optimism for the future. So with that, I will wrap up and hand it off. Thanks, Dale. Uh, a lot of great information, very optimistic year for 2024, but also you know, still need to be cautious on, on some degree. Um, but on the materials portion, I think that's a great segue for Alita. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll try to share now. Let's see. I have to do a one, two, three step. Here we go. You guys see my screen okay? Not yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, thanks, Robert and the SAA for inviting me to join the discussion this this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, we track materials and are experts in supply chains, specifically for electronics and um, and uh, with a specialty on the semiconductor market, to be sure. Um, like the others here, um, our forecasts are updated quarterly, and we do a deeper assessment at the beginning of the year. Uh, we do see the economy having a big impact on what goes on. Um, and so when we do our forecasting, we look at GDP and have seen that um, over the last couple of years actually slowing down on a global basis as well as a domestic basis. So um, let me see if I can fix my screen here in terms of, okay, here we go. Um, so uh, the wild card to all of the, of what's happening. Uh, yes, I completely agree with Dale and Dan on geopolitics and um, the economy, but what seems to be driving a lot of the materials growth, of course, and, and interest in investment are these chip fab investments. Um, there are now about $685 billion worth of investments that have been announced since 2022, largely driven by chip acts Every, in every major region of the world. Um, and these are stimulating the material sector. Um, before we get deep into materials, I uh, wanted to mention that the US, which um, uh, in accordance with the SIA's work has represented about 12% of the world's chip revenues. Uh, how much of these investments here, which are in the US now about 885 billion um, how much of that investment is going to help grow this 12% share is yet unclear, but I should mention that this amount of money here shown represents about 27% of the world's FAB investments. So it would stand to reason that the U.S.'s share should grow beyond 12% over the next five to 10 years. Um, the timing of these fabs coming up to volume uh, production is critical to material suppliers who are trying to figure out when and or if they should expand production. At the moment, there have been delays that have been announced pushing production uh, HVM uh, out to 2025 or beyond. Samsung, TSMC, Intel Ohio have all announced delays. Um, but regardless, we do see chip revenue growing this year, um, largely due to the bounce back from last year. Uh, so excuse me, I'm not gonna read everything on these slides. I pulled them from some other uh, activities we've presented at, um, earlier this week. This is our semiconductor forecast that we have to do in order to figure out where we're headed on materials. Um, our model does show an 11.5% growth this year, helped by a recovery in the memory market and growth in AI. We suspect the industrial and automotive segments, which were so hot last year, will continue growing, but at a, a, a lower level uh, this year. 
So um, the growth we in the material segment are waiting for, the big boost, we won't see until 2025 when the market we believe will shoot beyond where it was, hopefully it will, shoot beyond where it was in 2022 to hit levels above 770 billion. And that elusive $1 trillion, uh, Dale touched upon it, uh, we're in agreement. We don't see that happening until maybe 2033, um, hopefully not any later than that, uh, depending on cycles and the economy. Um, all of these trends though, will continue to drive healthy materials demand, which bring me brings me to the next slide, Let's see. We see mm -hmm. growth in materials of about 7% for this year, and coming up even stronger in 2025 at nearly 9%. Shown here are all the material segments we track, consumable equipment components, which include quartz and ceramics and some O-rings, for example, silicon wafers. Uh, we do track silicon carbide, but it's not shown here. And then there are process materials, which are all of the chemicals, gases, and slurries that go into the front end processing and followed by packaging materials. Uh, one key point here is that the market decline that happened in 2023 hit wafers the most. Um, this is because of an inventory correction that had to go on um, due to a huge amount of overbuying by the chip fabs. Um, and still into this quarter, we are seeing uh, that inventory still being burned off and we hope that will be done and buying will continue uh, at the end of second quarter. So um, for the future though, the highest growth segments do include materials that cater to leading edge logic and memory. And, um, and those include, and, and those include materials like etch gases, precursors, CMP consumables, some of the high-end lithography uh, chemicals and, um, and cleaning chemicals. Uh, packaging materials should also get a boost for those that are focused on the advanced packaging areas like substrates and glass. They should also see healthy growth in the teens. So a positive outlook, but ca with caution. So um, that, that brings me to this chart, which is kind of a reminder to me to mention that in the materials segment, the, there have been a lot of expansion announcements as well. This is just one of several pages of investment announcements that we maintain. Um, I will mention that in the US, we find suppliers hesitant to invest without long-term orders or proper subsidy. And many of them um, look at the CHIPS Act as uh, being something that will not serve them well we're not well enough to make a difference. Um, many material companies uh, find ha and have, have realized that they are not included in the investment tax credit that is mentioned in the CHIPS Act. And, it's, and they feel that it's not enough subsidy and uh, tax credit to give them the ROI that is needed to build the plant. So, uh, so there's some companies that are that are hesitating because they don't have that long-term agreement with chip fabs to to justify building a new plant or expanding. But there are companies that are still uh, applying for funding. Most of them are large companies with deep pockets. Uh, and um, uh, but the Chips Act for even for them is not going to be a game changer. Um, they are going ahead and investing without, some of them, without any CHIPS Act funding promises at all. Now, uh, those of you who have been very excited about the announcements of the uh, multiple fabs that, fab site that is in Taylor, Texas, that Samsung is building, and that in TSMC, might wonder, well, what about those suppliers that uh, support them from Korea and Taiwan? Several of those foreign suppliers have pledged to establish facilities in the US um, and they are still waiting to decide 
uh, whether to invest or for fear of overinvesting or investing too soon. Um, Sunlit, for example, a leading supplier of sulfuric uh, uh, hydrofluoric acid, excuse me, they are a maker out of Taiwan. They have built a brand new facility in the Phoenix area, but at the moment, it's really no more than a warehouse to receive imported goods, which they have said uh, they will change over to manufacturing when demand justifies it. So uh, they too are you know, trying to pragmatically figure out when and or if to further invest. Um, finally, one other factor that has and will continue to impact the market, especially materials, is geopolitics. Um, supply chains uh, are forever impacted by, by war and, uh, and tariffs. And a lot of times what happens in the supply chain is delays in materials due to these types of conditions because many of the materials have to be shipped on the ocean. Several of them are critical minerals that are being perhaps used as a, um, a political uh, item to withhold by one country from another, just try to be very politically correct here. Um, but if war in the Middle East were to escalate further, it could have greater impact on helium and petroleum-based products, with this, which the semiconductor industry depends upon quite heavily or if tariffs and, and or trade restrictions between China and the US increase, this can also have an impact on many of the materials, the process materials, which are at the moment very highly dependent upon uh, raw materials coming out of China. For the moment, things are stable and you know, we're choosing to be the optimists that, uh, that believe that stability will continue there are a number of factors, Dan pointed out, that could rock the apple cart per se, but short of those things changing the market outlook and the economy, uh, the, the outlook for 2024 and beyond is very positive for materials. A lot of exciting areas in the material segment that are growing and um, with or without shipped act money. So, my final slide is just a summary, um, talking about the slowing of the global economy, just making sure that people understand that and geopolitics are both factors in growing industry, um, growing the industry forward. And that there are, have been delays in the fab expansions. So material suppliers are approaching the industry with expansions very cautiously, but overall, everyone in the market sees the materials as being a very positive place to invest. And uh, this year should be very good growth, uh, waiting for that big boost in 2025 and growth should remain positive through 2028. So then technology advancements will ensure that this happens. So thank you. That's what I've got. On to the next speaker. Yeah, um, another very cautiously optimistic. Uh, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> 2024. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, to Chris. Great. Uh, thanks, Robert. Thanks for joining. And I, so I'm way beyond cautiously optimistic for 2024. I'm full on optimistic. This is the most uh, bullish I've been in in quite some time on semis. Uh, so I'm your friendly neighborhood stock analyst here, Chris Danley. I work for Citigroup. I've been uh, analyzing the semiconductor stock space for about, I guess, 25, 26 years or something like that. So I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, what we like, what we don't like and how the market works and what's going on with, with semis and stocks. And so if I had to use two words uh, to describe the sort of financial sector relationship with semiconductor stocks right now would be love affair. Um, you know, last year, uh, like, like uh, the colleagues have said, last year for semis was really one of the worst we've had since 2001. Um, you know, revenue was down uh, 8%. I think it was down, you know, double digits in 19 and 
I want to say in 09, it was down nine, but you know, that's, that's pretty rare. Uh, and units were actually down uh, almost 20%. So it was not great from a fundamental uh, perspective. Uh, and units being down that much hasn't happened since 2001. Um, you know, why was that, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious now, uh, and most of the semi companies are admitting that, that there was a massive uh, inventory build uh, post COVID, uh, just because of all the supply chain issues and things getting shut down. I mean, you had one of the best upturns uh, ever. Remember, semi revenue grew, I think it was 27% in 2021, that was the best year literally since 2000. Uh, and semi revenue was up again in, in 2022. Unfortunately, a lot of that uh, ended up being some inventory build. Um, and so you had a lot of extended lead times. And whenever you see uh, extended lead times, you have an inventory build. We have this um, like top 15 rules of semi investing. Uh, rule number one is don't ever buy or sell based on valuation. But one of the rules is whenever the lead times uh, uh, extend or go out, you want to buy the semis because that's when you get the inventory build. And basically last year was a period where those lead times came down and that's when you sell the stocks. Um, now, the stocks uh, were, were down uh, in the first really three, four months of last year. But if you look at what happened you know, overall last year, uh, the average semi-stock chart look, looks like the Statue of Liberty, right? So, you know, what happened? The SOX index, uh, SOX index is basically like a basket of about 30 or 40 semiconductor stocks. On the year, after being down in the first three months, it ended up being up 70% uh, for 2023. Um, it was a good year for stocks overall. Uh, the S&P was up 26%, but, you know, semis were were more than double that. Um and I confess, like, you know, so many of my peers, we were pretty cautious on semis, you know, really in, into the summer, um, just because we saw the numbers going down and, and fundamentals eroding. But, you know, that that didn't matter. Um, and what happened? So from a stock perspective, uh, everything changed when NVIDIA came out uh, last May. It was essentially the shot heard around the world for semis. Um, may, maybe you all remember that that kind of beat uh, and raise of guidance literally hadn't happened since uh, 1999. I hate even making that comparison, but that was that was big time. And you know, after that, it was a, an, a sort of an AI mania. Uh, it didn't really matter, you know, what companies said, what management said, how bad it was. It was like, you know, it was like Tinkerbell was watching over semis for for the rest of the year. You might have a couple of bad days or or a bad week, uh, but you know, no matter what the semiconductor company said, the overall space just went up. People wanted to participate, and as it turns out, you know, Nvidia and AI was a I, I guess a presage uh, for a few other companies uh, that also benefited from AI. You know, most notably AMD. Um, but also Broadcom, and now you're starting to see it uh, spill over into, into memory. Um, but really what happened with the stocks was what we call the multiple went up about 50%. So there's, there's two components to a stock price. There's the earnings and the multiple of what we, people will pay uh, on that earnings. And so the average multiple for a semiconductor stock last year went up 50%, five zero. Again, that has not happened since 1999. We haven't had this sort of like mania uh, since 1999. Um, and again, you know, if I had to explain the, the semi market and the tech market, it's very much a momentum market. And so once the direction starts to change, uh, people will really start to, to chase, the, uh, chase the stocks. So, you know, I remember Rob said in the beginning of the webcast. I think revenue ended up being, you know, down 8% last year. Uh, we were all expecting it to be down a lot more. And then towards the end of the year, uh, that revenue estimate went higher. And so once people in the stock market and, and me as well started to see that sort of change, right, even though revenue was down, once you see the, the estimates start to go up, you go, okay, I've seen this before. And so that was when we started to, to really um, bang the drum. Um, and if you look at the fundamentals, uh, to sort of break down the semiconductor market last year, you really had a sharp divide. 
uh, between what we would call the, the compute uh, slash AI market um, and handsets. You know, compute AI started to recover in the summer. Intel put up some good quarters. Uh, handsets started to recover towards the end of the year. Qualcomm and Corvo and Skyworks said, hey, you know, our, our business is getting better. And memory was just at the tail end uh, of last year. And that was that was enough. Um, but there were some noticeable pockets of weakness that still exist in the semiconductor space, uh, most notably the industrial um, end market. And then also the automotive end market is, is starting to, to fall off. So if we look at, you know, like what the state of semis is right now, I'd say about half of the end markets are, are looking pretty good. You've got PC market, which is clearly recovered, the handset market, which is clearly recovered, the AI market, which is very, very small, but, you know, obviously that one's uh, on fire. Um, so that's about half of semis. And then you have about a fourth of the semi market that I'd say is, is kind of muddled right now is, you know, like the, the, the sort of the broader data center, you know, server market and the broader consumer market. It's not great. It's sort of recovering off of last year, but nobody's really pointed to that saying, hey, this is great. You know, we're really happy to sell into here. And then you have one fourth of the market, which is the industrial and the automotive space, uh, which to be frank is terrible. Um, industrial units, so analog devices just reported yesterday. And if we sort of uh, amalgamate what the analog companies are saying about their industrial business, that business is down like 35, 40% from the peak and the units are down 30% from the peaks. This, this is pretty bad stuff. Now on the positive side, you know, ADI blows up yesterday, microchip blew up a month ago, and those stocks are up. You know, people are scratching their heads. How does this happen? Well, you know, if, if units are down 25, 30%, and clearly the end markets are not down 25, 30%, you're going to get a pretty, pretty sharp uh, bounce. And I think that's, to us, the silver lining. We actually have buys on on a couple of those stocks. And, and I, I predict, we predict that before year end, you're going to see a pretty sharp bounce in that industrial business because it's fallen off so much. You know, on the automotive side, that is just starting to correct. Uh, so we're forecasting some more bad news there, but I think we're probably through the worst of it on industrial. So, you know, like I said, overall, we're we're very, very bullish on semis this year because of that 20% decline uh, in units from last year. And that should provide some some inventory replenishment. We saw it in the PC space last year. We think we're going to get it in, in broader semis. Um, you know, we're most excited. I would probably uh, get walked out of my office if I didn't say AI. I'd probably get walked out, shot, and buried in the street. Uh, and I think really what's going on with AI, um, because people are trying to, trying to get their arms around these huge numbers that NVIDIA is throwing out there. And really what has happened is that, you know, because... Uh, of the benefits of AI, or you could say perceived benefits of AI. The customer base is rapidly expanding. And what I mean is, you know, traditional semiconductor buyers would be, you know, a cloud service provider, AWS or Google or Facebook. And, you know, maybe there's some, you know, large server companies, right? You know, Lenovo or HP or whatever. But now you're starting to see both domestic and foreign clearly buying AI. You're starting to see universities buy AI. You're starting to see just plain old companies uh, buy AI to try and take advantage of that. And traditionally, these you know sort of entities, I guess, have not really uh, been in the market uh, for semis. So you know we think that's going to you know clearly benefit not just Nvidia but AMD, uh, Broadcom is another company we follow. And then lastly would be uh, memory. And I predict that. Um, you will see as much buzz around the memory space for AI probably by the summer of this year uh, as the DRAM space uh, continues to uh, to recover. Um, so we're at about 11% or revenue growth for the semiconductor industry this year. I know it's a little higher than the SA. I hope that's okay. Uh, and our bias is, is clearly upward uh, off of that. And then one more, um, you know, sort of comment or thing that I, that I want to talk about before I turn it over uh, is really uh, the CHIPS Act is another big deal for the finance sector in semis. And the reason is we think that it's more of a benefit for the equipment companies 
than the semi companies because if you look at the amount of money from the chips act in the us the chip there's a chips act in europe there's a chips act in asia this is going to be 100 billion dollars uh, that's thrown at semis not all of that's going to go towards purchasing equipment but if the total you know wfe or total equipment budget per year is you know let's call it 80 to 100 billion and you've got you know 100 billion thrown at semis even if even if a third of that goes towards equipment that's like a you know 30% increase in uh in the TAM. So we really think that that's going to be the, the biggest beneficiary of the CHIPS Act. Um, and I see we have a bunch of questions and I'm out of time. So I'll, I'll stop there and we can turn it over to the floor. Thanks, Chris. So so it's it's great to see the, the contrast between the, the cautiously optimistic and the, and the very optimistic. Um, so we have a lot of great questions from the audience. I, I, I guess I'll just start with a clarifying question for Dale, um, just to to make sure we answer that. So on the electronic component revenue growth slide that you, you provided, Dale, um, were you looking at the data from a consumption perspective um, or a demand creation perspective, uh, especially around where they were designed in? That, uh, that data in terms of uh, revenue is based on uh, the shipment side in terms of uh, uh, reported revenues by the semiconductor company. So it's not the consumption when they're consumed at the end process where it goes into the equipment. It's based on when it's shipped from the semiconductor supplier. Great. Thanks, Dale. Um, and another clarifying question for Lita. Um, so considering the increasing demand for, for energy efficiency um, and high power devices, do you view growth um, the growth potential in, in, in market trends for gallium nitrate to be going up or going down in the coming years? Lita, I think you're, you're still muted. There we go. Um, it will definitely increase. I mean, all, I, I agree, the energy efficiency and high power device demand, which is increasing and will continue to increase, will drive the gallium, the need for get more gallium, gallium nitride and gallium substrates. Um, and on top of that, uh, there is, uh, we anticipate an increase in prices because of the geopolitics between China and, and the US. So um, that's something that is, is just gonna happen because of the, the trade and trade tension that's going on today. So, thanks, Lita. So now I, I want to make sure you know I get everyone's perspective on this. And and Chris, you definitely touched on this. And and it's the idea of, of AI being a major driving factor in, in semiconductor demand moving forward. But it seems like some may think this will be the major, the only demand driver for for semiconductors moving forward, and really helping the industry reach that trillion dollars. And, and Dan, I'll start with you to see uh, your take on that. I think it's uh, it's not the only driver because you have you still have all the baseline drivers. I mean, we still ship mainframes and supercomputers and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and if you look at our industry, what we've had is we've had these plateaus where you start off with military in the 1960s, going to mainframes in the 60s and 70s to the, the uh, um, you know, onto the PC, onto the, the smartphone. And now the next big thing is is AI. And the smartphone is where the PC was 10 years ago versus the smartphone when the smartphone became the big, you know, the big underlying, you know, moving, keeping that curve on that high growth rate that the semiconductor industry has always had. And uh, that's where it, it really drives that. That said, it's unquestionably, the thing that's going to be adding to the size of the semiconductor industry, everything else we're just, you know, going through and replacing. And uh, uh, so that's really the future. And we're, we're you know, right now, as, as Chris was pointing out, you, you know, we're moving from this period where, you know, you have researchers then to big corporations and, you know, then to, to universities and just small corporations are buying them. You know, we've been using it, um, the, uh, uh, you know, and, and so you've had this, you know, um, 
but now we're going to move in from training to inference and it's going to be more inference out there and i think what's really fascinating too is is that you know we're kind of going you know if you were an ai five or ten years ago you had to be a coder and we're moving now to where you can program um ai with language you know you have natural language programming of ai now that we've uh, that's never been there before and so it's almost like the what happened with the pc when you get uh excel and word you know these these basic functions that anybody can use you don't have to be a coder to make it happen and that's going to make our ai huge especially as it moves into the you know the pc smartphone all the different applications that that it could be used where you know mere mortals can program it <laughs> So Dale, I, I see you're you're laughing. Uh, how about your your take on that question? You know, I, I think just just one other dimension when you talk about AI. Dan alluded to it at the end there. You know, AI is an application, but you you need to translate AI into all the different types of equipment <laughs> that needs to come together to enable AI. And so, yes, you do need processing power in the compute platforms, and so. That bodes well for the processors, for the memory, and, and everything in that side, in that sense. But uh, there are other elements that need to come into play to support it. If you're going to, to do AI in a mobile world, you need to have the communications dimension. You know, you would need to bet, have a better build out of 5G technologies. And one of the things about all of this is just the massive appetite for power and energy that these AI applications have. And so you're going to have a, a real benefit to those who are developing solutions uh, for energy. You know, you've got people like Bill Gates, you know, he's gonna build a small nuclear reactor for some of these uh, uh, server farms, but beyond nuclear reactors, just the point of it is that uh, the, the voracious appetite for power and energy that will be generated by all of these AI applications is something that needs to take place and that goes to power semis, uh, analog ICs, you know, all of these materials of silicon carbide, et cetera, gallium arsenide. Uh, so so you, you need to translate AI into what does it mean for the necessary enablers. Thanks, Dale. I, I think that's a, uh, another great segue for, for you, Lita. Uh, what do you think, um, how do you think about that question, but also in the material space, um, do you see a corresponding increase in, in growth for specialized materials? Well, the kind of yes and no. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to AI, the materials that are currently being used today would suffice. Um, the question is, uh, can we get enough of them to support the growth? And that is one of the real concerns as we approach 2025 with all the hesitation in from the material side to build, um, there will likely be another situation where supply chains are constrained as we head into 2025, because people don't wanna make plants unless they're sure that there's gonna be volume demand there. So why not just wait until the supply chain gets sort of strained and, and we're in a shortage? Prices go up, material suppliers are happier, chip fabricators are unhappy, but you know, this is another kind of cycle that we have seen over the course of, of several decades. And uh, with this new ramp that's expected in 2025-26, um, it, it'll be exciting to see what happens there. But yep, there's going to be demand and constraint as we go forward, to be sure. So so back to you, Chris, and, and we've gotten your thoughts, but based on what you've heard, um, what, what do you think about that question? Sure. So I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a finance weenie, right? So just to put it in the numbers, AI is great, but it's not the only thing in semis. You know, for example, clearly AI was a huge theme last year and overall semi revenue still went down 8%. So if you look at the total percentage of the semi market, AI is probably between 5 and 10%. Um, you know, we're very, obviously very excited about that. Uh, it's great for graphics some processing and some part of memory but you know you're looking at maybe 10 15 percent of memory and 10 to 20 percent of processing and, and a lot of graphics beyond that 
Uh, we're still longer term very excited about the automotive and the industrial spaces, even though we're going through a massive correction there. That's where we see the most uh, content increasing. So, you know, for the long term, those are two of our you know favorite end markets along with uh, along with AI. But I think from a stock perspective, right, uh, what Nvidia has done uh, for semis really hasn't been done since 1999. So fundamentally, yeah, it's it's helping, but stock wise. Uh, you know, Jensen should be like elected president of the SIA for life after what he did for the uh, for the stocks for for semis in the last uh, 18 months or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we, we have a lot of other great questions, but unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour. I want to thank my panelists again, Dan, Dan Hutchison from Tech Insights, Dale Ford from ECIA, Lita Sean Roy from TechSet and, and Christopher Danley from Citibank or Citigroup, excuse me. Um, thank you again for the, the great insight um, on a, another housekeeping, a, a, a recording of this webinar will be on the website uh, starting tomorrow, as well as, as the slides that were presented. Thank you again, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.